Welcome, everybody. Uh, we haven't met before. My name is Richard Hopkins. I'm the artistic director of Florida Studio Theater. Uh, how many of you have been to Florida Studio before? Good. A hundred of you. How many of you this is your first time? Right? A smattering. How many of you don't remember? <laughs> Another smattering. Good. It's good to have you all with us today. This is a, a really special day for me personally uh, because my young friend, John Spellman, who is also the founder of Florida Studio Theater, is here with us today uh, to tell some stories uh, as he is painted uh, by Elise de la uh, So it's a special day for us. Uh, usually, people who don't know John thought that he was probably 101 years old. <laughs> as you can see, he's not. It's 103. <laughs> And still very spry. A shot of whiskey every day. Right. <laughs> but it, it's important to remember that John is a founder of Florida Studio Theater, and one of the things that over the many years since 1973 when he founded Florida Studio, one of the many things that we've continued to share and have in common is the importance of doing art that is viscerally connected to audience. And John continues to do that to this day through his storytelling and acting. And for our studio theater does it on many stages. So it's a pleasure to have them here today. And we want to thank the Hermitage for making this happen. Uh, Richard Caswell, our think is here today, having a chance to say hello. Thank you for uh, uh, allowing these guys to do this good work this afternoon. I think you're in for a special treat. And uh, <coughs> Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop looking at you in a moment. Uh, uh, and, uh, I'll explain in a minute. But it is, uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. Such a high to be here. I'll uh, tell you in a few minutes. Uh, to see all the amazing things that Richard and all the people have worked so hard here from the community and those people in the theater to make this the big success it's become in Sarasota. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm also really pleased to be part of this, what I regard as an experiment, which was an experiment that, that Felix sort of began. Felix has done dozens and dozens, or perhaps scores of paintings, of quick paintings, uh, of, of people while they talk including Holocaust survivors or other people talking about their backgrounds or whatever interests them. And what interests me most is narrative. Uh, so I'm just going to be narrating things to my friend Felix here, like this, and you get to, you get to watch us on television. Uh, but so what made it possible for me is to think of this as a live television show, right? I can't pay too much attention to you because it's the TV camera that I have to pay attention to. Uh, but David Letterman, you know, you can even turn out and say something. I'm going to try not to do that. <laughs> I, you may catch me jumping up or looking at you, and Felix will yell, don't do that. Uh, because he, he, of course, needs the, the face. Uh, I've, it's been such a pleasure to be at the Hermitage and to, uh, to share a house with Felix and to get to know each other. And we're already uh, uh, talking about some possible other projects together. <clears throat> This space, I'm going to stand up for a second, <laughs> right here, uh, is where I did my very first solo performance in, believe it or not, friends, 36 years ago in December. Uh, right there, I did a, a, a piece called uh, The Fire in Me Now, The Life and Works of Samuel Beckett. And I sat on a low box with my knees up in front of me for an hour and a half. So I thought I'd start with that hour and a half. No. Uh, and I also did my second solo performance here, was when I came back after Richard had taken over the theater. I came back because uh, uh, there was an opportunity to do, I believe it was a seven week tour of the state of Florida uh, with narrative performance, solo performing, storytelling, uh, a, a piece called Talking Tales, uh, which were stories I'd collected from Florida crackers. Uh, there's still about nine left in the state. Uh, and so I thought I would begin with telling you some of those. Uh, so in that Samuel Beckett piece, I was sort of channeling Samuel Beckett 
In Talking Tales, uh, I actually wore a costume, but I still talked directly to the audience. It took me a couple more years where I could stand up wearing my own clothes and say my own name, <laughs> because I, I, was, I was coming out of theater. So, uh, Yancey Register's just been introduced. I'm going to jump all around here so you'll bear with all this. Uh, and Yancey, Yancey says, hello. You Felix? Am I saying that right? Felix? Felix. With an X? <laughs> Felix, it's, uh, it's really proud to be here and uh, uh, to meet you. But I'm telling you, I, I'm a little nervous. Uh, arty people and all that, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why the way I'm supposed to behave. Uh, I mean, I'm used to, to telling stories, but I'm usually just sitting around home on the front porch or you know, around a Texaco station. But uh, here I am in front of a lot of people. There's a TV camera on. We don't even have TV, Tom. Uh, I'm re really kind of edgy, like a, like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> but I think I can get a wind on and I can get going. And uh, I guess I should tell you about how I got here. I, I, I don't know if you know this, because it was Miss Patricia that made that happen. Uh, what I've mostly done, I grew up in a little farm along the Withlacoochee River. Withlacoochee, that's a, an Indian word. It means with your coochie. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Indian word means river of bright waters. It's a beautiful, beautiful little river. And I grew up there with my family, with mom and pop naturally, and Jeb and Celie and Dealey. They was twins. But Dealey died when she was 11. And Tom and Polly and Everett and me and Matthew and Burl and Earl. Uh, they, they wasn't twins, but they were born one after the other. And uh, Aunt Mady, Uncle Phil, uh, Elizabeth. And then a whole bunch of people who never lived with us. But we all had this uh, really close family. We used to get together for play parties, all day sings, house fixings, uh, shell shucking, and storytelling and singing songs. And that's where I started. And actually, that's mostly what I've done. I mean, I've had jobs. I worked on a farm. I helped shrimp a little bit. Uh, I, was in the I worked in my brother's restaurant for a while. But mostly, I just tell stories to people. And I think that's how I come to be here, because this lady, she went and wrote a book about crackers in Florida. And uh, I was in the book. I had a whole chapter. It's called Yancey. You can see a picture of me. Didn't have my shoes on, but I look pretty good. And that book, it got published. It's not published no more. But Miss Patricia says she saw a copy of it, and she calls me up. And she says, uh, hello, Yancey? I says, yes. She says, this is Patricia. I say, hi, Patricia. Who are you? And she says, uh, she, so she explains, she works with this, uh, this artist's retreat down on the beach. And uh, when I come in, there's an artist there, really you're an interesting painter, would you come and tell him some stories? And I says, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and she said, why? I said, I don't want to talk to artists. <laughs> but she kept insisting that I come, you know. And I said, well, when would it be? And she says, March 6th. And I said, oh, that's not going to work. My dog is giving birth that day. <laughs> and she says, well, that's too bad, because we were going to pay you for it. <laughs> I said, what'd you say? <laughs> she says, we're going to pay you for it. I said, send me a bus ticket. I'm on the way. So here I am. Now i got to figure out what to tell you. <laughs> I was born uh, when there weren't so many Yankees in the state. Excuse me, folks, but uh, there are an awful lot of Yankees here. And uh, they used to be a real curiosity. You know, there's a saying around my house that I was growing up that a Yankee, that's some guy who, who comes down in the winter with a $20 bill and a clean shirt and leaves without having changed either one. <laughs> but, of course, as we all know, I mean, look at Sarasota, for God's sake. I mean, just there's all, all this money around now. You have Yankee money. Uh, and of course, they got involved in politics too, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, we started making money off it. Like my brother, he opened this restaurant along uh, Highway 41. This is back before that big highway come in, and uh, he was doing pretty good. You know, he said, "Cracker food, stop here," and uh, people did because there's no place else to stop. 
and you know they'd ask for stuff, and, and, and he had a lot of good, good, good old Florida food. But but he says people were they didn't know what they were doing. He says these people from big cities up north would drive in and say, okay, I want some uh, nice uh, Florida food. What you got? He says, well, we make our own grits here. Grits? What's grits? So he'd give them some grits, and but then they put milk and sugar on it, you know. Oh, at one time, this Yankee lady comes racing in. She slides into the gravel parking lot. She jumps out. She runs in. Oh, my God, where's your bathroom? And she runs into the bathroom, and she comes back out and says, well, I, I guess I should buy something. Maybe I could have some lunch. What you got? He says, well, you might like today's special. She says, oh, what's that? He says, well, it's a cracker special. We got a nice, fresh beef tongue. <laughs> she says, beef tongue? Yeah. No, I, I, I don't think anything, I, I could eat anything that came out of an animal's body. Uh, just give me a couple of eggs. <laughs> and then they started getting involved in politics. I mean, it's bound to happen, you know. We, we didn't have much politics. I mean, we just took care of ourselves. I remember when I was growing up, Daddy had a big corn crib out back of the house. And... Uh, didn't lock it up or nothing. I mean, nobody locked up anything back in those days. And uh, it, was, it was about this high, maybe. And uh, it had a little door on it. It made out of logs. And uh, he'd just cram it full of corn, you know. And when we got hungry or the pigs needed some, we'd, we'd eat. So uh, one time, though, he went out and it looked to, to him like somebody had taken a bunch of his corn, you know, like a couple of bushel baskets of corn. He asked around, and nobody had taken it. So he went out the next day and checked, and there's more corn missing. What's going on? Third day, more corn missing. Well, he went into town, and there was one place that sold locks. And he bought a little lock, a hasp lock, and put it on that, that, that door. Went out next morning, unlocked it, and there was more corn gone. Well, he looks around real careful, and around back, where you couldn't see it from the house, was a place where one log could be pushed up from another. You could reach an arm in there, and if you worked for a while, you could steal a lot of corn. Well, Daddy didn't fix that log. He just left it there. And the next morning, he went out first thing in the morning, walked around back, and sure enough, there's this Yankee kid from down the road sitting there with his arms stuck in the hole because uh, Daddy had put an animal trap in there. And uh, Daddy just walks up to the young fellow and says, Morning! Looks like it's going to rain. He goes back in and eats breakfast. After a while, he calls over some of the neighbors and says, I, I caught a critter in my trap out back. I want you to take a look at it to tell me what this thing is. And they go out there and they say, well, I don't know. It looks to me like some kind of a varmint. And old Jeb, he lived across the road, never had any teeth. You know, Jeb says, dog, I ain't no varmint. He says, that, 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 that looks like to me like some kind of a weasel. <laughs> and Daddy says, yeah, I guess we better do something with it. So they took the fellow's hand out of the trap, took him into the house, fixed it up. He wasn't cut too bad. And then they sat him down at the table for lunch, fed him a good cracker meal. Afterwards, Daddy took him out back, filled up his croaker sack, and he only got about eight, eight pieces of corn in. He filled it all the way up and says, Now you take this home, and you tell your parents this is a gift for me. And uh, they're going to get another big gift if you ever come back here and steal my corn. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, we never had any more tr trouble. And nowadays, you know what? That man, that old Yankee boy, grown up, of course, and he owns a whole chain of restaurants along Interstate 75. <laughs> <laughs> so then the Yankees are saying, "Well, we, you know, we gotta, uh, we gotta get some political power here." So then they're trying to get elected to city council or school board or all that. Uh, we didn't have no school board; we just had a school. And uh, but 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 you know everybody's wanting to get elected, and of course they start making promises, right? I remember this one Yankee fella. He came around to old uh, Evans farm, and he says, I, 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 "Could you put together a couple of crackers for me? I want to speak to him." Because uh, he you know he was out scouring the bushes for crackers, and uh, I guess about eight or nine people went over there. He stood up on a hay bale out in the yard, and he starts making promises. You know, boy, you you elect me to the county council. I'm going to make sure that you all have a, 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 a cow in your backyard. You're going to have a pig in your sty. You're going to have a free gas for your car. I mean, he kept making these promises because every promise he'd make, you know, the, the audience would yell, hoo-ha, hoo-ha. 
hoo-ha. So that fired him up, but he's making more and more promises. You know, tell them they're going to get new cars. I mean, he's just promising. Hoo-ha, hoo-ha. And he's so excited. He says, well, i got to move on to the next place, but it's been so great seeing you, fellas. <laughs> and uh, he starts to leave, and uh, the owner of the place, you know, says, wait a minute, my son's going to show you the shortcut back to your car. <laughs> he had nowhere to park. He takes him across the pasture there, the boy leading the way. Uh, he's about halfway back to the car. He says, oops, uh, careful there, mister. Don't step in that hoo-ha. <laughs> We had another fellow thought he should be elected because uh, his uh, father was a bishop, not, not a Roman Catholic bishop, a, a, a bishop in the Methodist Church, and uh, that's a, that's how they were trying to sell him. They are they are trying to find every cracker vote they can find, and they go they go out to old uh, Elmer uh, Lantry, Elmer Lantry's place, and this poor old fellow is, is deaf as a post and uses one of the great big uh, hearing horns, you know. Yeah, and even then you got to shout into the horn to get this fellow to understand you. So they're talking to him and they finally get him to understand that it's an election that they're talking about. Because he keeps missing words. And uh, they said, well, how come you want me to vote for him? A couple of them shout down that hearing horn together. Because he's a bishop. He's a son of a bishop. <laughs> Well, sure, says the old fella, all them politicians see us. <laughs> so it was, it was good growing up in Florida. And I knew, oh, there's some crackers, know some great things. I met this fella, name is Elvie Calloway, he's gone now, but he, he wrote a book, you could read it. Uh, he lived up in the Panhandle, and I went to see him one day. He says, son, I'm going to tell you, he says, do you know that the Florida, uh, the Garden of Eden was located right here in Florida? Now, I don't mean a housing development, I mean THE Garden of Eden. Uh, it was located uh, right here in Bristol, Florida. God created the Adamic man one mile east of town, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then he caused there to grow every tree pleasant to the sight, including the gopherwood tree. And this is the only place in the whole world where they grow. And it's also in Bristol that Noah built the ark. <laughs> built it out of gopher wood, like the Bible says, and pitched it with its pitch. And after that ark had floated for five months and landed at Mount Ararat in Asia, that's when Noah gave Asia the place names he'd known in Florida, like Euphrates and Sumatra. And I know it's true. You can read your Bible. It says, so it says, it says a, a river uh, flowed out of the garden and parted and become three heads. Well, sir, there's only one three-headed river system in the entire world. That's the Apalachicola, the Spring Creek, and the Flint Creek. They all flow out, out past Bristol. You can see them for yourself. You just stand there on the Jim Woodruff Dam and look north. And I wasn't sure I believed him. But you know, eight or ten times since then, I've, I've kind of looked around Florida, just suddenly sometime in the right light, you know, and I think, oh my, if I was God, and I was going to create the Garden of Eden, I'd probably put it right here in Florida. <laughs> I met another old fellow down south, lived around Lake Okeechobee. He, uh, an old farmer, uh, knew a lot of farming stories. He'd also uh, uh, had good friends who were Indians down in there, and he knew a lot of Indian stories. And as he got older, his stories would get kind of mixed up in his mind. He'd tell what you could call uh, farming Indian stories. <laughs> but I remember this one he told me. He says, Yancey, he says, Yancey, this is about the time after the Great Spirit had created the world. You know, the sky, the clouds, the trees, the water, plants and stuff. And uh, he's up on his cloud and he's looking down. And he says, boy, I did a good job here. And uh, some of the grass sees him looking up there, you know. And the grass says, sir, hey, sir, spirit right here, it's the grass. Sir, we're happy to be here. We know we're pretty. We enjoy being here. We like feeling the wind, looking at the water. But you know what? We're by ourselves an awful lot, and it's kind of boring. Could, could you make something pretty? Spirit thought, well, okay. 
So he went down there and he grabbed the tops off the trees and he crunched them all up and threw them out in the, in the grass and he caused there to grow flowers. And then he says, well, that'll do. And he zips back up to his cloud. And then after about 10,000 years or so, he hears these voices calling up to him again. From, it, it, it's the flowers. And they're saying, oh, sir, sir, grass is boring. Grass is really boring. We need something to attract our attention. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, people are always needing something. So this time he goes down to the earth and he takes his big tomahawk and he cuts the tops off all the trees in the whole world. See, before that, all the trees was 400 feet high. And he takes all them toppings and he throws them out there, throws them up in the air and then starts grabbing some and, and making these little things that, that, that go like this. And they're all fluttering around, you know, and, and the people see them and they say, whoa, hey, great spirit, what's all this? And the uh, spirit says, oh, I don't know, I'm tired of making up names for stuff. You make it up. And they said, no, 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 tell us what they're called. And, and the spirit says, well, okay, those things, uh, those things is flutterbys. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he says, see, son, don't you get it? Even way back then, the people down here weren't listening too good to what came from up there. <laughs> they thought he said butterflies. And that's what we've been calling them ever since. <laughs> So that's a little bit of my friend Yancey. Uh, he and I were very tight for a while. I, uh, I used to get checks made out to Yancey Register. And I would just sign them over to John Spellman and it worked fine. <laughs> <laughs> the last solo performance I've done, uh, I perform a lot for people in all kinds of different locations and for children and adults. And, uh, I've continued uh, doing the prison work that we did in the early years of Florida Studio Theater. Uh, we also went around to trailer camps. And, and Yancey actually toured to, to small town women's centers in honor of our home here. Uh, but I also do uh, full length uh, evening stories for theaters for adults. And I thought I'd try a little bit of that with you today. Uh, its title has been changing. Its, currently, its current title is uh, Outpacing the Bull. And uh, it runs about an hour, an, an hour and a half, and I thought I'd just like to tell you a little bit about pieces about, about that. Well, I'll just tell it a little to you. I now live in Baltimore, Maryland, after 25 years in D.C., and uh, last year, a, a, a bull got loose in downtown Baltimore, where I live. There are still a number of slaughterhouses there. Abattoirs is the polite name. That, uh, abattoirs, and this thing had gotten out and was running down a median strip, uh, produ uh, pursued by 12 police cars very slowly. They were Because they were trying to protect property and, and people. They stayed in the median strip for quite a while. They finally got him cornered, and he got frightened, and, and they had to shoot him. And while I was thinking about that, I realized that some years before, in the neighborhood directly above where my house is in downtown Baltimore, a neighborhood called Butcher Hill, there had been a lot of abattoirs. And from oh, two of them once, I don't know whether it was a planned arrangement or not, but about 15 uh, bulls had gotten out and were running around the neighborhood. And uh, three or four of them apparently came the wrong way down my one little narrow street at that time. Of course, I wasn't there then. And one time, I'm just thinking about bulls here. One time, I'm a backpacker, and when I was out backpacking in uh, the Appalachian Mountains, down near a place called Mount Rogers, I decided to take a shortcut through a little mountain pasture. So I climbed over this wooden fence with my backpack on, and I'm about halfway across this pasture when I saw a herd of cattle. A small herd, but nonetheless a herd. And they saw me, and they all turned and started towards me. Now, I'm a city boy, I didn't know what that meant. So I kind of backed up a little bit and then they seemed to be picking up speed a little bit. And so I turned and started walking pretty briskly back to the direction I'd come to climb that fence again. And then I realized that a, a four or five of them had picked up a pace out in front of the others and they were getting closer and closer to me. And so I, I started to trot, but I, I had really numb feet and I didn't feel all these uh, 
loose rocks under my feet and I tripped and my face went right down to the side and my pack kind of held me down there for a minute, but I could hear them getting closer. So I stumbled to my feet and I moved just as quickly as I could, but this one bull right in front actually caught up with me and he leaned his head against me, he was a very heavy fella, and he leaned his head up against me and pushed me steadily towards the fence and pushed me up against the fence and then took a step back. I says, he wants me to go over it, I'll do that. So <laughs> I went over the fence and we stood there and looked at each other for a moment. And then he kind of waved his tail and he walked off. And I, I then made a circuit around that pasture, which cost me about an extra mile and a half, but I was happy to do it. <laughs> so I went to a doctor, this was in DC, about my numb feet. and. Uh, he takes a look at my feet and my ankles and my toes and then he starts sticking me with this sharp little needle and saying, does this hurt? Can you feel that? Does this hurt? And he's sticking me all over the place and I'm saying, no, I can't feel that. Mm, maybe a little. I don't think so. Did you really stick me? Uh, maybe tickles? No, 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 no. Are you still sticking me? No, no. He puts his needle down and he says, well, Mr. Spellman, you've got numbness in your feet. <laughs> I said, yes, I, I, I know that. What causes that? He says, well, it's just numbness in your feet. Don't, don't worry about it, you're getting old. <laughs> and I said, well, what causes the numbness? He says, neuropathy. I say, what's that? It's a numbness, he says. <laughs> It, uh, it usually occurs in your extremities. Okay, we've established that I have numbness in my feet and my feet are part of my extremities. What causes neuropathy? Oh, oh, well, neuropathy is the name we give to numbness or tingling that we can't otherwise diagnose. But don't worry about it, it's just your age. Well, what causes that, I said. He says, well, age is usually determined by how many years you have. No, 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 I said, what causes the neuropathy? Don't worry about it, it's just neuropathy, you're going to be fine. Anything else on your mind? Yeah, uh, I pee all the time, and it's getting to be a real drag. He says, well, I'm not an expert there, but uh, I would say, did you know that all male mammals have a prostate, and yours, like most human males over 50, is quite likely enlarged? You have probably got a big prostate, but don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Whoa, I thought, so I got a big prostate. Size does matter. <laughs> and, and it's my big prostate that makes me pee so much at night and sometimes puts me in emergency situations during the day. Uh, situations embarrassing or dangerous. I, I once almost drove my car, as well as me and my daughter Anna, over an embankment as I tried to stop too quickly on a gravel road in order to jump out and relieve myself. <laughs> Daddy, do you think maybe you should see a doctor? <laughs> Anna's always inquiring about my health. I'm, I'm older than she wants me to be. Another time, I found it absolutely necessary to pee into a jar as I sat behind the wheel of my car in gridlocked traffic on a bridge over the Potomac River. My mother-in-law sitting next to me. <laughs> Looking decorously out the passenger window. Speaking loudly over the sound of me cascading into a plastic coffee. John, it, is that Virginia on the other side? Isn't that curious? And look at those rocks and the little rapids. It's very pretty. <laughs> I have to tell you, Felix, those were uh, two of the best relief peas I ever Because <laughs> <laughs> in those days, I, I was still ignorant. Uh, I did not know how important my prostate was to my overall physical and mental health. But a year later, a big prostate had become more than just a drag. This has got to stop, I say to the doctor. This is no longer even funny. No, sir, he says, it's not funny. Mr. Spellman, you probably have BPE, and that can become serious. And people with serious disease, sir, are five times more likely to have a heart attack and 12 times more likely to commit suicide. You, Mr. Spellman, need to relax. Well, I was relaxed. <laughs> I mean, 
Before BPE, benign prostatic enlargement, I had to look it up. I, I, I was relaxed. I mean, I, I had my share of physical problems. But still, I was relaxed even when I saw my thigh open to the bone after a motorcycle accident. Well, I was 18 then and definitely immortal. <laughs> but still, most of my physical issues have been slowly progressive. You know, hearing failing, eyes weakening memory slipping, nouns disappearing, <laughs> neck sagging, belly protruding, neuropathy, head hair thinning, nose hair proliferating, <laughs> young women calling me sir. <laughs> In the months I now call a post-BPE, Liz and I moved from Washington to Baltimore. After 25 years in Washington, we were empty nesters looking for a change, a shake-up in life. It worked. Life got shaken. We bought a house on one of Baltimore's little inner-city alley streets, a street about 11 feet wide and 20 houses long. And that the old-timers still call this place Happy Alley. And Oh, the Happy Alley people were very glad to see us. Hey! Oh! Hi, hi, hi! You're the new guy, the one that bought the brick house, the double wide. Yeah, okay, all right. I met your wife. She is okay, all right. Hey, hi. Do you live on this block? Listen, it's okay. We welcome all kinds. <laughs> hey, yo, 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 tall man. Whoa, you've got to be the father of that tall girl. How many of you living in that tall house? Hey, listen, tall man, I'm out on the street a lot, so you ever need help, you just call me. My name's Willie. You just say, hey, hey, Willie, help, and I'll be there. And this street is so narrow that you can sit on your stoop and talk to people on three or four other stoops simultaneously. <laughs> hey, John. John. You know that house up the next block that burned the other week? That's the same place where in 79 they found that woman's head. <laughs> well, people died on my block too. I mean, two men died of prostate cancer. Robert down the far end, last thing I heard him say before I learned he was gone, ain't been to a doctor in 40 years, no insurance and no money. And William crossed the way, he never trusted doctors, and that, combined with the fact that he was African-American, put him at high risk. Well, John, we was 51 years together. I miss him something terrible. So, John, I'm praying. I'm praying for you and Liz that you are going to get your tests on the right schedule so that you don't let cancer get started on your body. You hear me? Oh yeah, Marty, absolutely, I hear you. Thank you. If I ever even suspect cancer, that's exactly what I'm going to do. But of course, I was busy. I had a serious leak under my bathroom floor. <laughs> I was spending 25 to 30 weeks, uh, hours a week in my car because shortly after moving to Baltimore, I started getting a lot more work in Washington. <laughs> well, I was now the sought-after out-of-town artist. <laughs> and we had, perhaps mistakenly, bought a four-story townhouse. Uh, and I've always had bad knees, so <laughs> within about two months, my left knee went out. That led to a trip to Johns Hopkins Medical Center, where I acquired an internist and an orthopedist. The internist is now my doc, Eileen. And the orthopedist was good, the knee healed up. But then, over a period of months, I began to feel persistently fatigued, sometimes out of breath on the stairs, sometimes unable to focus on a simple task like washing dishes. So I went to see Doc Eileen, and she says, well, you need to go to a cardiologist. So I had a stress test, uh, I, I had a barium test, I wore a 24-hour heart monitor, I had an echogram, echocardiogram, and uh, everything was fine. After every test, I say, well, it's fine, it's fine. And she said, well, what about your lungs, your liver, your bladder? So I asked Doc Eileen, what about my bladder? Good idea, she says. I think that'll be my next step for you, cystoscopy. 
So my cystoscopy is done by a busy doctor who does all his cystoscopies on Thursday mornings in a kind of assembly line. So six men without their pants, <laughs> each man lying on a rolling little hospital bed, and each bed placed in one of half a dozen curtain cubicles lined up along one side of a wide hallway. And in each cubicle is a cheerful female medical technician <laughs> wearing fresh latex gloves. And I'm wheeled into mine and she says, hello there, Mr. John, I am Brandy here to fix you up. <coughs> and each woman then cleans and de-germs a man's penis. And then changes gloves and rubs a large smear of anesthetic cream onto his organ. And to make all that seem more normal and everyday, the uh, women are each chatting a bit with the men on their gurneys, you know, uh, sports, television, weather. <laughs> and, and the woman telling to me, Mrs. Brandy's about halfway through that anesthetic process when her hand suddenly slows down and she says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, aren't you John Spellman? <laughs> hey, Dina, look here, this here is John Spellman. <laughs> Dina's head peeks throughout the court and her feeling, John who? John Spellman, she says, didn't you ever see his TV show? Oh, oh, I doubt it, says Dina. No, Mr. John, I'm right, right? You used to have that TV show where you told stories? Yeah, I say, that's right. I thought so. Boy, I liked that show. And it was cute, too. Uh, <laughs> the name of it? Uh, <laughs> big and tall. No. <laughs> Long and tall. No, so it's not, it was something tall. Yeah, three stories tall. <laughs> oh yeah, three stories. That was cute. Okay, you're done. And she peels off her gloves and she rolls me down the hallway and pushes me into a little room where I'm greeted by two more cheerful people who cheerfully take a small camera on a very small cable and stick it slowly up my urethra and into my platter, making the insides of each visible on a large TV monitor, which I'm cheerfully urged to watch. <laughs> oh, Mr. John, look at this. Whoa, <laughs> turn the corner there, huh? Look. Whoa, what is that? You hardly ever see that. You see it, Mr. Spellman? <laughs> well, my cystoscopy showed me that my bladder, although and my urinary equipment was perhaps a bit weary with wear, it was all safe and sound too. Well, said Liz, let's keep looking. So Doc Eileen sent me to get a colonoscopy. And that made me nervous because I had recently heard a story about a Frenchman who had died during his colonoscopy. That the thing they put up his behind apparently ignited his internal gas and he exploded. <laughs> too was all fine. And then Doc Eileen went through my old records from Washington and she noticed it had actually been quite a while since I'd had the standard prostate exam, what they call the, the DRE, the digital rectal exam. So, so she gives me the DRE and then she kind of sighs and she says, oh, I'm going to have to send you to somebody else. This uh, urologist I know. Well, why? I said, is something wrong? I don't know, she says, my, my, my finger is just too short to be reliable. <laughs> So she sends me to this other guy, and his finger is thoroughly sufficient. <laughs> he says, Mr. Spellman, we should talk. He says, uh, what you have there, sir, is a, a boggy prostate. A healthy prostate is more like an orange with a firm outer skin and a soft, pulpy interior. But you're pretty all over pulpy. <laughs> well, that led to a series of blood tests called PSA tests, which can indicate cancer, and my PSA level was rising rapidly, not good. Well, I said to Liz, looks like we're finally on to something. <laughs> Doc Eileen sends me to get an MRI. And I arrive and the medical tech guy says, he's showing me the machine and he says, uh, you ever had one of these? You're nervous? And I said, yes, and yes. But I was glad to be keeping my head outside the machine this time, right? He said, yeah, right. And this here, oh, never mind. What? I said, well, he says here, this button where it says press for help, don't press that. <laughs> That doesn't work, it's on the fritz. <laughs> oh, but don't worry, don't worry, I can see it through the control room window. So if you had any problems, you just raise your hand, I can see I'll be running right back in, two shakes of a lamb stand. So he puts me in the machine and he leaves me alone. 
and there's this long pause, this very long, I mean maybe 10 minutes of nothing. And then finally this machine starts to crank and clang and wham and bang and wham and crank, and it whams and bangs and bangs for so long maybe 10 more minutes, 15 minutes, and I begin to wonder what too much magnetic resonance might do to my body. And then 20 minutes later, my enlarged prostate is urging me to take a pee. <laughs> so uh, I raise my hand. No one comes in. I raise my other hand. No response. Uh, hey, some help in here, please. Nothing. Just more whamming and banging and a growing need to get out of this machine and safely into a toilet. I figure if I if I wet myself, either me or the machine is going to short circuit. <laughs> Nobody's coming. I raise both hands. Nothing. I beat on the outside of the machine. Get in here, damn it! Get in here. Nothing. Finally, I pull and I push my way out of the MRI machine. I snake down about three feet to the ground, get up, and I'm walking past the control room window to flip my attendant a digital visual. And he isn't even in there. So I open the door and I'm out in the hall looking for a bathroom. I walk past this man leaning against the wall studying his cell phone. It's my missing attendant. And he says, what are you doing out here? Taking a piss, I said. And I'm not coming back. <laughs> well, despite my French and my uh, abrupt departure, the machine's data turned out to be complete, or at least complete enough that my next stop was the biopsy table. Oh man, the biopsy. They take a transrectal ultrasound chronometer, chronometer, I don't know what it was, thing, they stick, it's about the thickness of a fat cigar, and they stick it up my transrectum, and they, <laughs> one part of it measures the size and shape of my prostate, and the other side, through this thing called a prostate gun, shoots a needle directly through the wall of my intestine and into my prostate with a sound like a semi-automatic pistol and the feeling of being snapped inside by a giant rubber man. Whap, snap, whap, snap, whap, 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 snap, snap, snap. This thing steals 12 tiny pieces of my prostate from 12 different locations. They're put onto a microscope slide. They're studied by a pathologist. And my pathologist says, Mr. Spellman, I've seen your slide. It's positive. You've got cancer. That's positive. <laughs> I was very positive. 10 out of 12. Cancer, 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 cancer. I got cancer. Well, Liz and I look at each other and we said, let's find out how bad it is, see what the options are, and decide what to do. We, we were both scared, but I think we felt confident that our luck would hold. The next most difficult step was the phone call to Anna, who was taking a junior year semester in Spain. And she cried and asked if she should come home. And I said, no, 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 it's going fine. It's going to be fine. Really? Absolutely, I said. Well, good. Dad, does that mean we can still take our hike? Of course. Great. But Dad, I don't understand. How, how did you get cancer? Well, then this piece goes on and talks about all that and uh, about how the cancer was aggressive but not awful. And uh, in fact, uh, my surgeon said, you know, you may actually have some time before we need to do the surgery. I think the cancer is all contained within that prostate capsule. And I decided to believe that and to spend some time with Liz. And then I went to Spain to take the hike with Anna, to be with her for part of her dream, to hike the length of, you'll like this part, Felix, in Spain. <laughs> Uh, to hike the length of the Camino de Santiago, the sacred way of St. James. It's a centuries-old trail, runs from the French-Spanish border all the way to Spain's northwestern Atlantic coast. And, uh, Anna, well, there's a number of different routes you can take to the Camino. Anna chose the one with the fewest tough hills. She wanted the challenge of the more difficult one, but she told me she didn't want an old man slowing her down. <laughs> it was a affectionate, sweet, sometimes goofy walk with Anna. I walked for 10 days and 90 miles through the end of my life with a prostate. 
my companion, this astounding young woman, half of whose DNA came from me, a human being created by the union of Liz's egg and my sperm, sperm which never would have made it to that egg without the prostate. That prostate I was now carrying would soon, would soon be without it. I was so ignorant, Felix, I didn't know what a prostate was and what it did. And finally, I asked somebody, what does it do? Why do I even have it? And the person I asked was this uh, medical student who lived next door to me on Happy Alley. And she was appalled by my ignorance. But she said, John, all male mammals have a prostate. You do too. The prostate's main function is to nourish the sperm, replenish them, keep them alive long enough to reach an egg should one happen to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> she said, now, without the prostate, your sperm might get up a creek, but they'll be up that creek without any paddles. <laughs> And you, sir, might never have helped make Anna. Well, I did help, and she was remarkable. On the trail, we kept talking to our fellow pilgrims uh, in English or broken French or Anna's excellent Spanish. While we're walking in cafes and restaurants and in the public rooms of hostels, we usually stopped about 3 or 4 p.m. in order to find a hostel and then grab an early shower while there was still hot water and still have time left to rinse out the day's clothes and hang them up outside to dry. Well, late one afternoon in a hostel on a little hill, we had split up and I found myself in a group shower room with three other men. Uh, and we chatted and joked in at least three different languages. And, uh, we enjoyed each other, older guys, talking about what an adventure we were having with all these younger people out on the trail. And one of them who spoke some English turned out he had had a prostate problem. Cancer, he said, you know. Cancer, bango, the little bang. And then it developed that all of us had had some kind of bout with cancer. And after the shower, we're drying off, and, and this guy, uh, Franz was his name, Franz says, oh, guys, this has been good here our talking. This has been good, serious talking. Like, like women in a steam room. <laughs> And a little later, I joined up with these three guys again, without intending to, out on the terrace of the hostel. And I found that the four of us were standing around a tub of water up on a stool, washing and rinsing out our clothes, laughing and talking, but really fi falling silent because it was moving towards dark. The breeze was blowing like balm over the rural hills. And we were all busy, I think, thinking our own thoughts. Two nights before, I'd picked up one of the paperback books that pilgrims often left for each other in the hostels. It was a copy uh, in English of Moby Dick, a book I'd never finished. And uh, I, I leafed through it for several hours, reading passages here and there, and one of Ishmael's stories now came back to me. The sperm from the day's whale kill, says Ishmael, the sperm from the day's whale kill had crystallized to such a degree that when with several others I was set down before a large tub of it. We found much of it concreted into lumps rolling about in the liquid part. And it became our duty to squeeze those lumps back into fluid. A rich and a sweet duty. My fingers had been in it for only a few minutes before they began to, to serpentine, and spiralize, and eventually also to squeeze the fingers of the other men. And, oh, says Ishmael at that moment, I wish then, I wish then that I could have stayed and squeezed that sperm forever. <laughs> but, he goes on, I have discovered that as I've gotten older that a man's interests will change away from the intellect, the vocation, the passions, and to more everyday things. Friends, the neighborhood, the dog, the child, the marriage bed. And home. I had remembered what I most wanted to live for. And then I looked up and my, com my companions were gone. In fact, there was nobody left on the terrace at all. I was standing there rinsing out clothes. I'd been rinsing for 20 minutes. And I squeezed them dry and hung them up. And then I sat down on the wall of the terrace, looking west along the next day's trail towards another little town on another hill. 
The sun was very close to setting when I saw a tall, thin man in black walking slowly towards me down that road. He was wearing a cloak. He had a staff in his right hand, but with the sun behind him, I couldn't see his torso or his face. And as I watched, he seemed to grow larger and larger and ominous and more ominous that I could hear his staff tapping the earth. I could feel his staff tapping the earth. And I pulled back up until I was sitting on the top of the wall. And he came closer and closer and closer. And I knew then that I could not walk that trail again. I could not walk it unless that being went back behind me and kept going to the east. And he did. He turned and he went past the hostel. And I knew he was gone because there was a slight rustle and a little puff of foul smelling air. See, I had paused for death, but he kindly passed me by. That night at dinner, Anne asked me where had I been, and I said, oh, sitting out on the wall watching the sunset. But that night I thought, maybe death was on the way to Baltimore. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't go back to Baltimore. Maybe I should move back to Cincinnati where I grew up. Well, you know, Mark Twain once said, when things might be coming to an end, I want to be in Cincinnati. <laughs> Because things in Cincinnati always happen ten years later than anywhere else. <laughs> that night I dreamed of bulls. Bulls parading down my street. And then the next day, Anne and I were walking along a wooded trail between trees on a high ridge and high pastures. And we stopped to peek into the, uh, the old abandoned stone barn. We peeked in under the arch and this enormous creature came out of the shadows and stepped forward towards us. He was broad and tall, his head as, my, as high as mine and crowned with horns that went up another six or eight inches. He kept coming slowly towards us and we slowly backed up until we could feel behind us the brush on the other side of the trail. And I thought I saw a faint path that went down through the bushes into the pasture below. And I said, Anna, this way. And she followed me down onto the grass. And we made it to the grass, and we then confronted directly in front of us three more of these bull-like creatures. They raised their heads from grazing, their eyes flashing, their tails snapping. They were digging their hoofs into the ground. This way, I said to Anna, and I put her behind me and I let her back up onto the trail to turn to go back the way we had started. But we'd only gone about 20 steps that way when a fifth ball, the largest one yet, came around a turn in the trail and stopped his face perhaps three feet from my nostrils. And we all stopped and we stood there watching each other. And Anna said, Dad, <laughs> Take it off and pass it back. They don't like red. I said, Honey, that's not right. They're colorblind. They are attracted by movement. Oh, she said, oh. Don't move. <laughs> I didn't. And neither did she and neither did it. And we just stood there listening to each other breathe until behind me I heard movement on the trail. And I thought, oh God, no, <clears throat> trapped. And suddenly this bull brushed, <laughs> this man brushed past me, spun me around, stepped up to the side of this massive creature, gave it a big push on one of his shoulders and said in English, move it, let us by. And this huge creature backed up about three steps and then moved slowly down through the trees and the pasture where the other three had been. Just got to show him who's boss, our Lord and Savior said as I watched his backpack disappear around the turn in the trail. I looked back towards the barn. I could just see the tip of the first bull's tail. 
we slipped easily past there and kept walking. And that night's dream was also about bulls, but now they were tiny little bulls. <laughs> Inside my body, crashing around someplace up above my pelvis and maybe trying to do me harm. But when I got back to Baltimore, I was able to go through a series of positive imagery exercises. And frequently I could turn those little bulls into big pink healthy cells that cold cocked the crazy sociopathic cells that were messing around in my nice prostate neighborhood. And three days later the prostate was gone. And then the story goes on for another 45 minutes or so. <laughs> Let's see what I can do in, if I took 10 more minutes, would that work? You may guess, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I would uh, just tell you another story about Florida. When I was sort of uh, researching, looking around, and believe me, we're going to stop so you can go do things. And it's a reception. <laughs> and by the way, it doesn't help to have your prostate removed. It actually increases the problem. So. Uh, there's uh, Felix and I, and, and, and you all are invited to uh, now the, the, the gallery that's on your program there within walking distance of here to, I guess, get a, a glimpse at this painting. I'm going to get a chance to see it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> It's going to be wonderful. I've loved seeing the little bits I've seen of Felix's work. It's remarkable. Uh, but come to the gallery and we can, we can chat there if anybody wants. And Felix does talk. He talks very well. <laughs> when I was researching the Yancey Register piece, I got to meet some people in... Uh, I went with a fellow to Niagara River Park who loved to fish. His name was Council, and the uh, Council says, oh, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite fishing holes. I said, I have no equipment. He says, we're just going to use sticks and old, old pieces of thread and a hook anyway. And I'll have worms in my pocket. <laughs> so we, we went out there, and I could tell I was going to enjoy this man, but he was driving me crazy because he was one of those people who talked too loud. I don't know if you know people like that or you've got somebody in your family. Uh, I have somebody like that in my family, and, and council talk like that, that when they call, you know, they say, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and I'm a little hard of hearing, but I'll, I still go away. So we're going, he's talking really loud, and I'm thinking, well, we're not going to catch any fish. I, I'm a city boy, but I know you're supposed to be quiet when you're fishing. <laughs> and if, where's he standing there talking? We go fish right here. And I guess if I wanted to catch any fish, I would have fished right there because he could have smelled them. But I decided I wanted to be a little distance from his voice. So I, I moved down to where I could still see him. And I had my pole and I uh, had my hook and he'd given me a couple worms. And uh, I watched while he just reached it, <laughs> worm on the hook, whoosh, boom, out came a fish. I said, whoa, this is great. So I finally got the worm out of my pocket. And you know, I, I talked to save, so I, I tore it in half. <laughs> and I remember when I used to take my daughter fishing and we'd tear worms, she says, Daddy, does this does this hurt the worms? And she said, No, honey, they like this, that's why they're wiggling right now. <laughs> so I put this worm on the hook and I dropped it down into the water, and pretty clear water there, I could see it, and this fish it was a pretty big fish. It, this was a big fish. <laughs> he swam up and uh, got that worm in his mouth and swam off. Yeah. I didn't have it on right. So I got another half on and I put it down. And I watched while the worm swam away. <laughs> I got one bite, no fish. He must have pulled up about seven of them. And uh, I'm walking back, walking back to him and I hope he's going to cook these because I don't know how to do it. And uh, I heard this really weird noise. It kind of And it seemed to be coming from a, a, a little kind of inlet off the river. And 
and I went to peek through some bushes, and there sitting up on a rock, and it must have just come up out of the water, that was that funny noise, was the biggest frog I have ever seen. I mean, this, this, this frog fish was about the size of your head. I mean, it was enormous. And it's sitting there on a rock, the water's still running off its body, and it's looking out towards the, the, the water, uh, hoping for some supper. And uh, it's council, council, come here, shh, 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 come here. Look at this, I bet it's the biggest frog you ever saw. Oh no, we got a real shh. <laughs> Could you be quiet? Because I want to I wanna tell my daughter about this. We've been studying frogs. This looked like one of the kind that could, could stick its tongue out really far distance. You know, you can tell by the shape of their mouth. I said, I want to see if it's going to eat a bug. And sure enough, <clears throat> two big butterfly, uh, uh, dragonflies came flopping down the water, uh, and the frog saw him, and he started twitching around and getting all sad. But before he could do anything, we heard this other sound, and up onto the rock behind the frog came this snake. I, I don't know what kind, some kind of a water snake, I guess. I mean, this thing was probably as big around as my arm and maybe seven feet long. And his head was just coming up. He was just going to get up on the rock the sun a little bit, I guess. And he saw that frog here. He's thinking, oh, supper. And he just stopped, you know, like they can do, stop on the dime. And his head just stayed there and his body just kept coming up and curling underneath him. And I said, oh, counsel, that, that, that snake is going to eat that frog. He said, you sh you city boys don't know nothing. He said, that snake ain't going to eat that frog. That frog's going to eat that snake. I said, you're crazy. He said, I'll bet you. How much you want to bet? I said, I don't know. He says, $11.11. .11. <laughs> okay. I was sure I was going to win. And sure enough, though, before that frog could eat, get that tongue going, that snake opened up his great big mouth. They just hinged back. You know, and he, boom! grabbed that frog right here at the small of his back and started swallowing it whole the way they do. And so here's this big frog going rear end first down this snake's mouth. Of course, he's trying to get away. You know, he's trying to jump into the water. But the big, strong snake, he's pulling him back. And they're thrashing around and thrashing around. And more and more of the frog was disappearing. And then all of a sudden, as they were thrashing around, the, the snake's tail appeared right in front of the frog's mouth. And the frog got the snake's tail in his mouth, and the frog started to eat the snake. <laughs> but, but the snake was still eating the frog, you see. So, so here they were, they were eating each other at the same time. And by that time, several people had gathered, and they were making side bets, you know. I mean, it was like, Right at the end, it was so exciting. I would have doubled the bet just to see what happened because you had no idea who was going to win. Because finally, there was only about uh, uh, <clears throat> just the frog's lips you could see, and, and, and about that much of the snake. And all of a sudden, they both took a big bite at exactly the same moment, <laughs> and they were gone. <laughs> Thank you all very much.